Hi, my name is Anita Puckett, and my testimony emerges from my commitment to serving and working with the people of Coalfield in southern Appalachia, both as a resident with a 300-year regional ancestry tied to it in deep and meaningful ways, and as an academic with a particular interest in studying language and stigmatization and disempowerment that in turn justifies for many the ongoing and seemingly unending bending or outright dismissal of basic human rights as stipulated by Articles 12, 13, and 17 of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rights that are now being challenged once again under the building of the proposed Mountain Valley Pipeline, which I'll call the MVP, a project that will result in the transmission of approximately 2.5 billion cubic feet of natural gas and is fracking carcinogenic residues under 1,450 pounds per square inch pressure. This gas is be, to be transmitted but not used locally except perhaps, possibly in two cases, through primarily Appalachian areas of the two states of West Virginia and Virginia. Local residents, as has been typical of the exploitation of the Appalachian region for the past 175 years or so, are in situations in which they are minority enduring human rights violations with little or no uh, recourse. Others will talk about the practices that MVP is doing um, that are decimating the rights of peoples. But what I want to focus on are the impacts on cultural resources by MVP that are also significant uh, with respect to the rights of human, with the, the violation, rights of eminent domain, impacts on the MVP that are also significant violations of basic human rights and dignity, as well as issues of environmental justice. Among them are, one, rights to own property and use it in a manner consistent with one's cultural values and mores. Landowners exhibiting cultural attachment have deep spiritual bonds with their family land upon which, generally, ancestors are buried and strong cultural meanings are instilled through narratives, ceremonies, rituals, and festivals, and the simple act of families living on it for as many as nine generations. Threats to these rights of cultural attachment, which are analogous to the rights of sacred sites on Native American land, have wreaked havoc on the elderly with several debilitating illnesses and one death attributed to the basic fear of having portions of that land reconfigured to the demands of permanent pipeline easement with all of the limitations there too, which are major and will not allow them to use it except in very limited ways. The integrated meanings given to the land through cultural attachment will not be able to continue. The adverse effects cannot be mitigated or ameliorated and the integrated sense of family, place, ancestors, and kin will not be able to continue in anything resembling their current form, at least as, uh, as constructed by the cultural meanings given to them now. Secondly, two, the abilities to use the properties in the narrow hollers and valleys found along most of the pipeline compressor stations will be decimated. The land is narrow, flat land is narrow. If it's gone into an easement, they won't be able to use it. They won't be able to build on it. They can't give it to their children for their houses. It's a mess. Three, water is threatened. About approximately 90% of the landowners along the pipeline corridor and the access roads that go with it use underground water through wells. And we know that much of that will be decimated through explosions, leaks, karst, and other kinds, corrosion, and other factors known to landowners through their own experiential knowledge, not necessarily through the, the reports which corroborate it. The three, uh, four is the three is the historic resources uh, especially in Newport and Giles County, Virginia, that will be decimated uh, by the rights to maintain a community's cultural history. They're running right next to some of these buildings, which they refused, MVP refused to report on the, to, their, uh, to, the FER, to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or in their reports. Finally, it's the psychological impact of having private land destroyed and the loss of economic value that goes with it, and people are suffering PTSD and other kinds of high-stress symptoms. The slightly of human rights violations extends crossing gender lines, but is being perpetuated by a number of other conditions that provide suitable context for MVP to succeed and for local residents to fail. A very large number of landowners have no internet access, no, even no cell phone access, so they can't get the communications. Everything has to be in print. They are left out in an untimely fashion a lot of the issues that they need to be addressing. Two, um, a lot, number of the landowners have been beaten down by previous efforts to resist other kinds of things, such as power lines and railroad construction. So now they say there's no point in resisting. We're going to lose. Don't invest the time. Three is issues of money and paying the lawyers. And of course, we've got, there are some free lawyers now, but pro bono lawyers. But at the same time, it's not working. 
Uh, the last one is that they have, uh, they don't have the time, they're working two or three jobs, they just have to survive and they don't have time for it. The construction of the permanent MVP Mega National Gas Pipeline represents an extension of a very long dismissal of Coalfield and Southern Appalachian residents as a lesser white population, one that needs not be treated as full citizens and whose human rights can often be compromised with impunity. In this case, a political leaning right can argue that it's all right to destroy people's abilities to use their land, undermine long-standing cultural attachment, etc., because of the market value of it. Meanwhile, on the left, they are saying that uh, they deserve what they get because they voted for Trump. Because on both sides, after all, many can say and are saying they're just a bunch of dumb hillbillies. <laughs>